Matt, I'll continue to let people in if you want to. Um, you sure. can. Welcome everybody to the Centre for Educational Neuroscience seminar. We're just um, waiting for a few people to come in from the waiting room and we'll start. Okay, welcome everybody. We're um, delighted that you're able to join us today for our Centre for Educational Neuroscience seminar. Um, today, uh, Sara De Felici is joining us to talk about some of her um, work in uh, social interactions in online learning environments. So Sara is a PhD student in the Social Neuroscience Group at the UCL Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience. Her research investigates the neural and behavioural features that emerge during uh, natural human social interaction and whether these features are associated with learning. She uses um, functional near-infrared spectroscopy to record brain activity from two people simultaneously and study their brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. And she also uses uh, motion capture, video and audio recording data to identify uh, behavioral coordination patterns during social learning tasks. So today, Sarah is joining us to talk about some of her work looking at social interaction in online, sorry, in online learning environments. So if you're ready, Sarah, I'll hand over to you and we look forward to your talk. Hi, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, so as, um, as Matt uh, told you, I work in the social neuroscience group with uh, Antonia Hamilton. Um, and uh, the work I'm going to present to you today is part of my PhD with more, with more generally um, uh, try to look at um, how do we learn from and with other people. Uh, so when the COVID-19 pandemic started, um, we asked ourselves how the, the lack of social interaction actually could affect uh, learning, if, if anything at all. Um, what I want to present to you today is what we found from two studies that we conducted online. Uh, during the pandemic last year. Uh, so since this work is extremely relevant and timely and important, it has important insight for the present, but also for the future of, um, of education, um, I really wanted to make sure that the findings that we got came across and the message was clear enough. Um, so I tried to think about what was the best way for me to present um, what we found in the best way possible. And um, I hope that I came up with a pretty good solution. Uh, so um, basically, I like to hand it over to you completely. And I'll use the 30 minutes of my talk for you to read the script of what I want to say. Um, and then I'll meet you in about 30 minutes if you have any questions. Okay, so how many of you have given up uh, or wandered off or if you even left, please come back. Um, I was just trying to make a point clear that I hope, yeah, I hope um, it was clear enough that it's quite actually, it's quite hard um, to uh, engage in any type of information if there is no speaker engaging with you. Um, so um, now I'd like for you to uh, spend a few seconds trying to recall the time um, and the, 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 the situation when you actually learned uh, some, of these things, some of these things, like to ride a bike or about every day eight swipes or the last from an emperor, depending on where you went to school, um, or how to pronounce a difficult word. So if you can replay in your head the context and the situation, the people you were with or the, the, the place or the book you were reading or the, the context in which you learned these things. Um, so I'm pretty confident um, that um, a few people thought about something like this, but the majority of you probably thought about something like that. So um, depending on from what age your memory was, um, you might have recalled to um, learn some of the things that I mentioned earlier, like riding a bike or about how to command difficult words with other people involved in your memory. So either your teacher or a friend or a colleague. Um, so I think that by now, I hope that I made the message clear enough that human learning is social. It's something that we do with other people and from other people all the time. Um, 
There is also uh, important evidence showing that, uh, for example, for development, social interaction is crucial uh, for, le um, for learning social interaction is crucial for development. Um, we know, for example, uh, that uh, in a series of studies, youth and SNP show that word learning in infants was happening specifically uh, during those times when there was a concurrent action between the caregiver and the infant. So specifically when the infant was looking at the object and putting closer to their eyes, so that it was visually dominant. And at the same time, the caregiver, the parent was telling the name of the object. So there was a clear interaction between them. And that was the moment when the infants showed the highest learning. Um, the, the cool thing is that interaction has been shown um, to support not only um, cognitive functions associated with communication, but also in other sphere uh, of cognition. So for example, mathematical reasoning. Um, so in this study, for example, five years old, um, they showed greater mathematical reasoning uh, learning um, when their teacher was physically present with them um, compared to when they were observing the same teacher on a screen. Um, and this is also reflected in brain development. So we know that social interaction is essential for optimal um, brain development across a series of functions, including language, but also visual spatial abilities and memory. Um, social interaction seems to be a booster in adult learning as well. Um, although findings in this area are a bit more controversial than um, what we found in children, um, for example, there is abundant evidence in second language acquisition in adults showing that um, learning things in interaction uh, seems to be associated with higher retention of uh, new vocabulary uh, compared to learning from videos. Um, however, when we look at more knowledge-based learning, so for example, learning facts in a medical course, um, some studies conducted on university students found out that there was no difference in exam performance um, between students who learned uh, by attending a live lectures compared to students learning from um, the same course online, uh, so from our, from our pre-recorded video content. Uh, the problem with these studies is that they did not control for exposure time. So in other words, the live session was only live once, but the the video content could be replayed as many times as the students wanted. So um, a fewer other studies controlled for this factor, and they actually found that, again, live interactive learning was better um, for um, knowledge-based content learning compared to learning from pre-recorded video lectures. Um, OK, so given um, what we know so far from the literature, we then ask ourselves, what about remote schooling? So how has our learning been affected by reduced social interaction during the pandemic? Um, we designed an experiment to find out. So we collected um, a few um, uh, obscure objects that you can see here. I hope you can see my cursor on the right. Um, um, and also I should have said, please do interrupt me at any point if anything is unclear, do ask questions as I go along or keep them for the end. Um, so we collected, um, we, we put together some facts similar to what you could hear in a documentary, basically, about different objects, including, including musical instruments, um, kitchen tools, ancient tools, uh, animals and food. Um, and we created different sets. And basically, uh, we instructed participants, um, like in the video played here, uh, about the facts of these different items over Zoom. But importantly, the Zoom class was not always the same. So we varied something in the condition in which we were presenting information. Um, so specifically, we uh, manipulated two variables, social contingency and social richness. By social contingency, we simply mean how interactive was the session. So if there is a back and forth between the teacher and the student, that's an interactive uh, learning condition uh, or a group of students as well. Um, if there is not, then it's, it's, it's not an interactive teaching condition. 
uh, quite clearly. <laughs> and then social richness instead is the amount of social cues present. So can I see the face of the teacher, the hands, or can I just see a slide? Um, so I included here a few examples of um, different teaching. Uh, for example, a situation like a classroom where you are in a group of people uh, face to face uh, is both, both uh, highly socially contingent and it's also very rich in social cues. Um, in contrast, um, a situation, for example, when uh, you're learning from a podcast, it's quite poor both uh, in social contingency and in social richness because there is no interaction and also you can only listen to the voice of whoever is the, the teacher. Uh, but you can't interact with them and you can't see any social cue apart from hearing their voice, okay? Uh, despite still being characterized as social learning, because as a matter of fact, there is a social agent um, through which we get information that we're learning, okay? Um, okay, so um, we designed a two by two experimental design and we had four conditions that varied on the basis of these two variables, social contingency and social richness. Uh, so we have a life phase condition in which basically the student is circled in yellow, squared in yellow. Um, and um, we have a situation in which basically the, the student was engaging in uh, the learning through a live uh, Zoom call with the teacher and the teacher's face was fully visible. Um, then we have another condition in which only the hands were visible, but the, the teaching was still alive. And then we have a recorded condition, which importantly was the live condition of the previous participant. So um, I'll show you a slide later on to, um, to show exactly what I mean. But basically every live condition of one part participant one would be the recorded condition of participant two and so on. And again, you have, we have the um, uh, hand condition and the, um, and the face condition for the live, okay? For the recorded as well, sorry. Okay. So this is the, um, a quick graphic of the design. We have a live um, session followed by a recorded session. The order was counterbalanced. And then for each trial, um, there was an alternation between showing the hands or showing the face of the teacher um, back and forth. And um, again, as I said before, the recorded session of um, the one participant was the live session of the previous participant. And these ensured that basically the only difference between conditions was the fact that there was um, the interactivity element in the live condition compared to the recorded condition. So it was about observing two social agents or being one of the agents interacting with the other one. Um, and they learn different sets of information in each session um, for a total of 16 objects. I've included here um, an example of Glaucus. So you can read the description. Uh, Glaucus is a mollusk, it lives in the ocean. So there is a, a few uh, facts about this is a, an animal. Uh, and then there is a quiz that they did immediately after the session online and then a week later. Um, okay, so this is what we found. Um, people remembered more things um, about the items that were learned during the interactive teaching condition, so the live session, um, compared to items that were learned um, in, the recorded, uh, in the recorded condition. Um, also, when learning from the recorded videos, seeing the face of the teacher helped. So we therefore ask at this point, what happens if instead of just showing the hands, we show something that is even less social and also more commonly used nowadays uh, in social learning online? So we replicated experiment one into experiment two, but instead of having the hands condition, we introduce a slide. So um, here, basically, everything was exactly the same as, as experiment one. Um, but basically, the teacher were in the, in the um, so low social richness um, condition, was not visible at all. Only the voice was present underneath. And then there was a slide um, 
instead on the screen. And it was the same for the live condition and the recorded condition. Um, this is what we found through experiment two. Again, we replicated for the second time um, the effect that learning specifically for um, the um, um, full face condition um, was better for interactive session. So when the full when the, when the teacher was showing the full face again, uh, learning things from the live um, teaching condition was better than learning from a recorded video. Um, we also found a trend uh, for interactive teaching um, consistent with what we found in the previous experiment. So when learning in interaction, seeing the face of the teacher helped. However, we found something um, interesting here, which was different from the previous experiment, and that is the opposite trend was true for the recorded video. So I hope you can see my cursor, but here, the trend is that the slide seems to be associated with better learning in the recorded video condition compared to seeing the face of the teacher. So let's have a look at our results um, of our two experiments together. Um, if we look at the two, two experiments together, there are two main um, conclusions that we can draw. Um, first thing is that interactive teaching seems to be associated with better learning uh, compared to recorded videos. Uh, and we found this in both experiments and the effect that we get is quite strong um, and quite robust. So social contingency seems to be the most important factor um, that was uh, predicting, uh, predictive of learning performance um, in these two studies. And um, I forgot to mention the sample size of both of the, of both of the studies. Um, so it's, it's a relatively um, um, medium sample size, I would say. So for experiment one, we had 25 participants, I think, and uh, experiment two was 27. Um, and of course, whoever participated in experiment one couldn't participate in experiment two. Um, okay, so first point is social contingency is important. Learning and interaction was better um, immediately after and after a week as well, uh, the session. When we look at social richness, uh, the pattern is a bit more um, complex, but quite interesting. So the pattern of the, the, that we observe for social richness cues in both experiments um, is basically showing us that when teaching is interactive, seeing the face of the teacher helps. And this was true in both experiments. Um, however, when we have a low social richness uh, situation, so either just the hands or a slide, the situation is a bit different. So um, it seems to be, so in both, in both experiments, we actually found an interaction effect between this, the two variables, so social contingency and social richness. In other words, this means that it seems that social cues impact learning differently, depending on whether learning is interactive or not. Um, so if we look at things one by one, so in experiment one, more socialness, so defined as both um, learning and interaction and having a full face um, view of the teacher seems to be better. In experiment two, when learning in interaction conditions specifically, the full face was good, was better. So here, the circle, uh, the yellow circle uh, blob in experiment two. However, when uh, learning from the recorded video, the slide was better compared to looking at the face. Um, so it might be that when participating when, when participating in interactive learning, uh, having the full face of the view uh, my, of the teacher might help the student engage in the interaction with them, which is functional to learning, which might not be the case when I'm learning from a recorded video in which I'm not interacting uh, with the teacher. Um, and in, in that case, it might even be distracting to have more social cues. And in that case, having a slide might help. Um, 
So if we look um, at these different conditions, so just to give you um, a quick reminder of what we mean by face plus hand condition, hands only, and slide condition. Uh, during the recorded video, participants were presented with the view of um, another participant. So it was like a, a form of observational learning in which they had to decode information by being uh, um, presented with um, a social interaction situation in which they were not uh, engaged actively. Um, so it might be that looking at someone else's face have, would diverge their attention. Uh, so instead of focusing on the information that they need to learn, they might be distracted by the other participant face. And in that case, just having a slide might, might help instead. In the case of experiment one, it might be that just looking at the hands might be an even harder situation to decode simply because it's something quite atypical. Um, it's something quite unusual to, um, to be looking at someone just um, through, their, through their hands. Um, which might make it an even harder social situation to the code. And it might, might be that it was more cognitively distracting, um, which would result in, in worse learning. Um, okay, so just to quickly summarize the main findings of these uh, two experiments. People learn better in live interactive video calls compared to yoked record videos. In live interactive teaching, seeing the face of the teacher improves learning. And in the recorded teaching, seeing a slide seems to be more beneficial for learning. So how do we uh, make sense of, of all this? Um, it might be that when observing two people interacting, um, when we observe two people interacting, um, we will naturally try to decode what's happening um, in that social situation. And uh, specifically, for example, who is thinking what and how each of the person involved is feeling, what their mental states are, um, what's happening. And if during this process, on top of it, we also need to um, process information to learn and remember long term, this might be extra hard. And actually process that social cues might be distracting because they are not specifically functional to the learning process. Uh, instead, being part of a social interaction during learning might be um, an efficient way of engaging and connecting with the other person. And in that case, having more social cues might actually help to communicate and support learning. Because if I can see the, the face of my teacher or if I'm the teacher, I can see the face of my student, um, then I can online um, try to uh, predict more efficiently what's going on. Uh, with the other person and modulate my behavior accordingly. Uh, so I might speak slower, I might repeat things, I might um, um, yeah, modulate the way I, I would provide information. And at the same time, if I'm a student and I didn't get something, then through um, even subtle and uh, sometimes even unconscious facial expression, movement, um, speech sometimes, if you like something uh, uh, openly explicit, um, I might communicate to my teacher that something wasn't clear and that might lead to uh, a more efficient way to transfer information and learn better. Um, importantly, I want to say that in this, in this particular design that we used, um, we control for things like repetitions and questions and things like that because the recorded, um, again, the recorded video was the live video of the previous participant. So everything was exactly the same. The point is that they were not part of the interaction. So whatever was going on in their own mental states and feeling and understanding wasn't possible to be communicated or communicate in the, in the, uh, in the issues of the teacher to the students and vice versa. So there wasn't this back channeling that would allow me for predictions um, between the two social agents, which is instead present in interactive learning. And this is what we think might be supporting uh, learning in interaction that is not present in observational learning. Um, okay, so now I just want to um, tell you a little bit about, um, we, we collected this data online, um, but we don't really know yet what's happening um, when people meet face to face and at the brain level. So uh, we are um, basically replicating the same study uh, using the same set of items 
um, in face-to-face uh, -face, um, interaction um, in the lab, uh, recording brain activity using FNIRs from two people simultaneously. Um, and uh, we basically have two main aims with this study. Uh, we would like to um, operationalize social interaction at the behavioral, physiological, and neural level. Uh, the idea is to try to um, have a picture which is more holistic. So lots of studies nowadays on ed in educational neuroscience uh, tend to only focus on one bit, either behavior or the brain data. Um, but it's not really clear what's happening when we integrate um, these data together. Um, which uh, might in fact um, held the most important piece of information because we do interact with, you know, holistically with other people when we when we engage in, in learning uh, socially. Uh, so we use our brain, we use our body, we use our hands, um, eye gaze, voice. Um, so the idea is to try to link this um, synchrony that is observed at the physiological and neural level and see how is that linked to uh, um, learning performance. And the second point is to identify proxies of social human learning. So can we actually um, predict learning from uh, physiological and neural measures? Um, so is the way I synchronize with other people actually a measure of how well I'm connected to, the other, pe to other people and in turn how much I, I will learn and remember long term? So these are the type of questions that we're trying to, uh, to answer uh, here. We collected already uh, multimodal data from um, 62 people simultaneously, so 31 couples. Um, so this is just um, our lab setup to show you a little bit how it looks like. There are two people here um, that come in. So before coming into the lab, participant red and blue, they individually learn uh, some information about the facts I showed you before. Again, musical instrument, ancient objects, animals and food. Um, all these facts are meant to be engaging, uh, so it's something that people could read in a magazine or, or learn in a documentary, but at the same time they are very well controlled, so every item and every set is meant to be matched in terms of challenge and, and difficult, like how hard it is to remember all these things. Um, and obviously it is the case that some people might um, be more into musical instrument than animal and they would, it would be easier for them uh, to remember those things, but I, um, I can reassure you that there are other people that are much more into food and animals and, and they don't really care about musical instrument and then you, you, you um, kind of um, compensate um, uh, across the sample. Um, and so they, they learn these things before coming to the lab. They come to the lab and then they teach these things to, to, to their partner. So they alternate between being a teacher and being a student. Um, and uh, during this process, we, um, uh, vid we, we uh, record their videos, we record their speech, and we also measure their brain activity and their physiological data in terms of uh, breathing and head movement as well. Um, so this is how the lab looks like. So sometimes um, we put a separator in between. Uh, so um, this is uh, not because of COVID, uh, it's actually part of the experimental design. We wanted to have a condition in which participants could not see uh, each other. Uh, and then for half of the trials instead, they could, uh, they could see each other face to face. So the idea is to see um, whether actually there is a difference um, in the way we engage uh, our body in the learning process uh, when we learn from and with other people and whether this make an impact on how well we remember things uh, later on. Um, so um, we um, ended uh, data collection for um, this experiment and hopefully we, hopefully we can share the results soon. So we are in the middle of uh, data analysis at the moment. We have this huge data set um, that we hope to, um, yeah, to, uh, to analyze soon and make sense of, of what's going on soon. And, and hopefully we can share uh, our results uh, very soon. Um, I want to um, leave you with this uh, quote, if, if it works. Uh, yeah, tell me and I'll listen, teach me and I'll remember, involve me and I will learn. And I want to thank you, all my lab and all the people involved in this study and in, in this work. Uh, thank you very much.
Thanks, Sarah. Really, uh, really fascinating work and an interesting talk. Um, so we've got a bit of time now for questions. If anyone would like to ask a question, you can put it into the chat box and we can read it out. Or if you'd like to raise your uh, virtual hand by clicking on the reactions button at the bottom, you can um, ask Sarah your question yourself. Um, so uh, we've, got, yeah, we've, got, ooh, we've got a range of questions here. From, um, so Alexandra is asking, thank you for this. There's a small difference between similar interactive social contingency um, with high social richness between experiment one and experiment two. Is there a reason for that? There is a small difference between similar interactive social contingency with high social richness between experiment one and two. Is there a reason for that? Um, there's no difference between similar interactive social contingency. Alexandra, I don't know if you want to just expand on that question a little bit. We didn't, we didn't do any analysis to compare experiment one and two simply because they, they were two different samples, two different, they were two different experiments. So we didn't, yeah, we didn't make any, um, any direct comparison of the two in terms of statistical analysis. Exactly, two different experiments. Right, yeah. And um, she was asking, was the learner's camera in the interactive teaching on? Was there something done with the learner's camera being off? So was the learning camera in the interactive yeah. teaching on? Yes, it was on all the time. Was there something done with the learner's camera being off? No, nothing. So the camera of the learner was always on uh, all the time. And it, that was actually a prerequisite of the experiment. So if they wanted to take part, they need to agree to have their camera on all the time. And uh, Alexandra's final question is how to interpret synchrony in accurate ways. Synchrony intuitively means that individuals are aligned, um, but desynchronization could mean that the person is analyzing a situation rather than observing it, applied for functional connectivity in adults and infants when it comes to imitation for observation action behavior in which case the person is still learning yeah um so in fact i think I, i'm using synchronization as a term because that's why using the literature but i personally think it's not the right um term to use um synchronization you're right it means that they are aligned but actually what it means when you actually look at the data it means that they are coordinated so for example, if someone is listening and the other one is speaking, you will still see some sort of um, uh, correlation in the in the frequency of the brain waves of the two people that are engaged um, in the same uh, conversation. That doesn't mean that the two brain activity are mirrored exactly, like they're not the same, but every time one goes up, the other one goes down, for example, and vice versa. So they kind of move in a dance, and that's what we mean by synchrony. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, um, but I agree that the word synchrony is a bit confusing. Um, um, Chloe, would you like to jump in and ask your question? Yes. Hi, Sarah. That was a really lovely presentation. Thank you. Really, really interesting work. I don't have anything profound to say or to ask, but I just wondered if there's a mismatch between how people actually learn or which condition they learn better in and which condition they prefer or which condition they think they would learn better mm -hmm. in. Just thinking about how we teach students and the yeah. different choices that we offer them. Yeah. We did ask this question. We did ask um, how much they enjoyed uh, different conditions. Um, and um, yeah, people seem to enjoy more learning and interaction. Um, we also uh, did a sort of, source of, uh, sort of source memory test. So uh, after a week, we asked them if they remembered for each item in which condition they learned and they couldn't really remember. Uh, yeah, so it's quite interesting, I think, to like to see what's the perception of like they still prefer to learn in interaction but after a week despite their performance was better for things learned live they couldn't remember which one was which um yeah um so that seems to be something going on that supports learning that is quite uh, i don't want to say unconscious because that's a tricky word to use but it, it's going like underneath our own um yeah, will or, you know, active engagement. Um, yeah. yeah, interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Laura.
Um, so we have a question from Astrid, who is asking um, if you felt that the effectiveness of learning in the face and hand conditions had anything to do with language processing, um, i.e. do you feel that being able to see the movements of the mouth while the teacher was speaking was relevant to the quality of learning? Um, it could be. Um, it could be, but that would be the case also for recorded uh, condition. Um, and also that wouldn't explain why the slide was better in the recorded condition. Um, so we really, yeah, we really do interpret this as we make, we make use of the social cue when they are functional to having an interaction from which I'm learning. Otherwise it's better having a slide. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's definitely room for more uh, more analysis on this. We're trying to, it's really time consuming, but we're trying to get all the video and um, make a, a open face software to decode the different information about uh, eye gaze and exp facial expression and mouth movements um, to actually see if there is any link uh, or difference between live and recorded condition and if this is associated with learning, for example, every time there is like a smile or how many times people blink or how many times people nod, uh, could that be a sign of attention? And therefore, could that mean that they learn more? Um, yeah, but we, yeah, we don't know. It, it takes a lot of time to analyze all this uh, big data set. Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a question from uh, Ralwan. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name there. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. Perhaps I missed it. Um, but which brain regions, stroke regions of interest, do you expect to play a role in synchronization? Theory of mind um, or network M yeah. B F C T P J or other candidate regions? Yeah. So no, you didn't miss it. I just didn't say it <laughs> uh, because it's part of like a second experiment that I wasn't um, plan to like properly um, speak about today. But um, yes, we basically record. We expect TPJ for sure to be involved in this simply because it might not be strictly uh, associated with learning, but it's definitely associated with social interaction. Um, we therefore think that um, that's definitely a, a good candidate. Um, for uh, to show brain synchronization um, when we learn from other people. Um, another area that might be involved is the, the frontal region, especially the prefrontal cortex. Um, and again, it might, going back to the other question that um, was asked before about the synchronization, it might not be that they light up at the same time both of the region, but it might, it, it, might more, more be like a dance. So if the, if the frontal area goes up, then TPJ might go down and, and vice versa. And it might be um, might be happening the, the other way around for the other participants. Uh, so we, we, we do expect uh, that something is going on between these regions uh, bilaterally from both people. So we actually have a coverage, it's quite big. Um, we have for the FNIRS, we have 38 channels per person. So they cover, both um, both hemisphere from frontal to parietal, um, both hemisphere, both people. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I can tell you more once we analyze all this data. Um, Thank you. Um, so Caroline's asking, do you think that uh, people's attention levels have a role in the differences? For example, um, when it's live and the teacher reacts to her people, she may retain their attention better. Similarly, if charts are changing and may uh, pay greater attention, so if charts are changing, you may pay greater attention in order to understand the chart before it goes. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely attention is um, probably one of the mechanisms involved uh, that might be subserving learning. Um, but that's the point, right? So if I'm engaging in a live interaction, and the teacher look at me and then I, you know, I get, uh, because of that, I get a feedback that I should pay more attention because something important is going on. This is, this might be the exact reason why learning in social interaction is more efficient than learning on your own. Um, it's through this feedback and back channeling of like going back and forth and me as a student noticing that 
me, sorry, me as a teacher noticing that that student is not paying enough attention, and then I might signal something with my eyes, and then the student will receive that and in turn show me that he's paying more attention. Through this mechanism, we might we might um, find a way to transfer information more efficiently. Um, so yeah, that could definitely be um, be an answer. But I think the, the cool, interesting bit is that all these signals were repeated in the recorded session. The only difference is that they were the, the student in that case was not actively part of that interaction. And that's, I think, what, what's interesting here. It's all this information about you know, eye gazing, it's signaling, and if something happened during the session, maybe it was like an abrupt noise that caught, uh, caught the student attention, or all these things were present, both in the live and in the recorded session of every single participant. And it was a repeated measure design. So every participant uh, did both sessions. Uh, and it was consistent across two studies over 50 people, they all showed that learning um, in interaction was better when they were actively engaging in it. Um, yeah, the other um, kind of related to that, I, I think in the, the first experiment across the two conditions, one of, one of the, I think it was the recorded condition, that the distribution was much larger than, than in the, uh, which almost looked a bit like something was moderating it or mediating it or something. And, yeah, we do interpret that as um, the fact that um, the hands condition was quite an atypical view to have, uh, and lots of people showed um, quite a bit variability in um, in performance in that condition. Um, yeah, um, but also bear in mind that the the. I think it's also how we plot the data because the, the quiz was uh, giving us, so every single um, item had a score out of five, which is like a big range. Um, so whatever you see is actually scaled to a much smaller uh, range if you actually look at the, the single number. Um, yeah. Um, uh, and a question about, because I think you described it as you had, um, one group were doing recorded then um, live, and then that was counterbalanced the other way around. Did you see any differences depending on the condition at all? Or... Um, so you mean, you mean if someone was doing live first and then recorded, was it different from someone doing? No. We didn't, yeah, we didn't check that because uh, it was exactly half and half. Right. Um, so yeah, no, we didn't, yeah, yeah, we didn't check that. But yeah, it could be, it could be interesting. The thing is that, they were learning different things. So yeah, that would mean like splitting the data into two and then make, yeah, make a, make a difference between the two groups. Um, yeah, no, we didn't, we didn't look at that. Um, so uh, we've got a bit more time for questions if anyone would like to ask any. Um, um, one th something that I was interested in was that, did you have a condition at all where you, it was slides and live? Or was the slides only in the recorded version? No, it was also in the live. Right, and, and yes. in the in the live, is it? It was it was better to have the hands and face rather than. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. do you do? You think that because I think we all do presentations and we have our cameras on and um, and they they generally got lots of slides. Would it? Is it? Is it worth us like not having our cameras on perhaps or? I, I would say the other way around. The other like, way around, yeah. Yeah, what we, what we see is that actually when it's live, it's important to have the camera on because if I, and actually it would be useful to have also the audience on for the teacher. So it's like yeah. a two way, uh, it's not just, and, and I think this is, this is one of the points that I'm trying to um, work the most on uh, in my PhD, trying to move away from only looking at one side of the, of the learning process, which usually is the student. Lots of, lots of studies only look at the students. Very little is known about the teacher. So if there is like a different in the teaching style and even less uh, is known about what's the interaction. So um, in this study, we actually show that it's, it's a two-way thing. And we, it's also for the student, it might be more helpful to have the audience with the live, with the, with the camera on so that this back and forth feedback can, uh, can actually happen um, when it's live, yeah. Um, thank you, cheers.
So um, if we have, does anyone else have any last questions at all? Um, before we before we wrap up? Um, I'm trying to find all the notes I've put down here. Do you think that the last thing I'd like to be interested in knowing about is that, did you, is there, do you think there could be contexts where a recorded presentation um, is, is more beneficial or, or maybe there's individual differences in learners where they might benefit? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think individual differences is the whole world. It definitely there are individual differences, um, but uh, this is definitely not the type of study that, sure. like you, you need like a much bigger sample um, to actually look at individual differences mm. properly. Um, and also, as I, as I mentioned earlier, when I was discussing the, the background literature, there might be situations which recorded material ultimately might result in better learning compared to learning live, but that might be a matter of repeating the information over and over, and that's why. So if you, if you have something recorded and the students can play it as many times as they wanted, then it might be more beneficial because if I get distracted, I can go back, um, if I can, you know, if I want to um, um, only uh, listen for half an hour and then I stop and then I go back the next day and you have this flexibility with the recorded material, which we don't have with the live. Uh, but, but that would be a different, different question. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, and and uh, Gwen has, uh, is asking, I'm wondering how this might relate to the idea of a, a flipped classroom. Where students are expected to read prior to the class, and the class consists of discussion of the context, not not its presentation. Um, Sorry, I so this is a fl yeah flipped classroom is a is a kind of um, an approach in in, in teaching where uh -huh. students have to kind of read and and, and um, watch watch recordings, for instance, and then come back. Yeah, I yeah, I um I can only speculate obviously um based on um what we found here, what I what I've learned in the literature. Um but I would say that it actually might work because in this type type of setup there is even more interaction, there is even more of this back and forth, which might actually help to uh consolidate the learning, like to create this common ground in which we share information and we make sure that both we create like a shared understanding of whatever the content is. Mm. Um, and it, it's a way in even like to re-manipulate the content and rephrase it. And so it's, it's, a, it's more active. Um, and also like doing with other people make it more salient. Uh, yeah. For memory. Uh, so Chloe's commenting that one of the things that students appreciate about pre-recorded lectures in the IOE's current blended learning model is having captions for lectures. Mm. I imagine this could be useful for learning vocabulary as well. Mm. And yeah. So, yeah, from my own experience as well, having like, I remember learning stats at the IOE and Rich, I can't remember who stats he was, but he did these amazing recorded lectures, which when the content is very uh, new and abstract to you is very very useful to go back over and again but um i think we'll probably wrap up now if unless anyone else has any last questions but thank you so much sarah for the really interesting talk and thank um, you. and um, thanks everyone for coming along and we'll hope to see you next week thank you thanks bye bye